Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thank you once again for choosing Fading Memories listeners. I greatly appreciate it. You're going to really enjoy today's discussion. I'm talking to Alexis Baker. She is a music therapist. And as I mentioned earlier, we are discussing dementia friendly music engagement. So thanks for joining me, Alexis. Thank you. It's so great to be with you today on the show. Thank you. So most of my listeners probably remember if they've if they've been around a while that I attempted to connect with my mom with music and use music for her benefit failed miserably. Uh-huh. <laughs> and there this was, you know, cuz she passed away 2 plus years ago, there was a lot less access to the information that you're going to share today. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, this is why I keep doing this podcast because I know it's like I'm still learning great stuff. So, you know, my biggest challenge was finding like music that my mom connected with. And yeah, I th- always attribute part of the problem to she was a huge talk radio person. She would have loved podcasts. <laughs> um, she listened to talk radio. She would turn the one TV on in the bedroom, one in the um, family room and so she could hear the same talk show as she went about her household chores every day. And Mm -hmm. I never really did figure out how to help her connect using like podcasts. And I was always nervous to use mine. So what is the best way to go about engaging with our loved ones with music? Like how do, how do we start? Like, what did I do wrong? (laughs) (laughs) Well, you didn't do anything wrong to start because it sounds like your mom really connected with the podcast. So that's awesome that, um, like you, you tried, you tried something. So that's actually the first thing is just trying and, um, you know, um, asking around, asking other friends and family members if they know anything specific So starting broad, starting with um, grabbing from a a couple of specific decades. And as a general rule of thumb, like most people relate most to the music from their childhood and then into their 20s and 30s. So you can do the math and figure out the decades and um, narrow it down to a couple decades And then um, try to narrow it down to like a specific style or genre or band or singer and just um, try lots of different things and then watch for the signs, watch for when you when you notice that connection. I'm sure you can see it in in their eyes, in their face. I, I've seen it all the time in my work where their face just lights up when they when they hear a song they know and love and all that. So that's a good starting point. Well, the, the way I finally found some music that she seemed to connect with was going back and thinking about what I heard my grandmother play, like when we were at her house, because I kind of figured if grandma liked it and I liked it as a kid, then maybe like, yeah. maybe it would scoop mom up. And it did work. Now, my mom was in pretty late stage Alzheimer's at that point. So this Okay. You know, probably would have been better to start earlier, but you know, my dad was in charge of things pr- prior to this, you know, point in time and he didn't try anything. So, <laughs> and, and he didn't know to try these things either. So to be exactly. fair, a lot of people are at a loss as, as to what to try. And there, there just always hasn't been the information out there available, but more, more information is coming out and um, especially in regard to music and Alzheimer's and dementia, um, people are learning more about how beneficial music is. And they played, always had music going in her memory care residence. And I think sometimes after a while it was just like background noise, which is very difficult for people. Like my mom could not tune out background noise. You could not take her to a restaurant because she would continuously complain about how noisy it was. I was like, oh, it was terrible. And I just recently learned that I just thought she complained constantly because she forgot that she said it was noisy two minutes ago, but they actually can't 
tune it out. Like we can kind of focus on, you know, like if we're at a party and we're talking, I could focus on you and kind of tune out all the noise around me, but that's not something that's open to them. It's tough when it's a part of an environment that you don't necessarily have control over and it it can become very overstimulating just too much for the brain to process because with dementia and Alzheimer's, like the brain is breaking down. So it's losing its processing abilities. And part of that is processing all the stimulations around us. (laughs) That is true. So when people, like I see people that they have like headphones on their loved one, like a lot. (laughs) And I always wonder how beneficial that is. Maybe it's there to help keep them calm or just kind of help keep them connected to this, this world. You know, Mm -hmm. once we find the music they connect with, what is good practices for, you know, engaging with them? Whole point of the talk today. It's Monday morning. I'm like, (laughs) (laughs) lucky I'm, my brain is engaged. (laughs) No, that's a great question. And, um, so with the headphones, it can be hugely beneficial, but as we just talked about, it can also become too much and overstimulating. So it's, it's not just something you can throw on them and just like hope it works or like it, it needs to come with intention and also paying attention to their response, what their face is showing what they, how their body is responding, um, because it like music can have a negative effect. So there's, there's that where it's, it can be a fine line of beneficial, and then it can start to swing to the other side of overstimulation and, um, actual harmful negative effects. So, um, I think the key is, uh, you know, your loved one best paying attention to how they're responding, not just, um, walking away and thinking they'll be, they'll be fine. (laughs) Um, but if you can find the right music, like it generally, it generally works really well and has a, a great benefit on the body physiologically, like helping regulate breathing and, lowering blood pressure, releasing stress and anxiety and, um, giving the immune system a boost. And if you can get them to, um, go beyond just listening, taking the music in, um, passively, you can get them actively engaging through singing along with the music, singing with them, um, hand them a a small, instrument that they can shake along to the beat or, or show them how, uh, you can try some body rhythm, like patting your lap, clapping, tapping your toes, snapping your fingers, find the beat. Um, that those kind of things really have a positive effect on the brain where it's, um, helping the neural pathways at a, (laughs) at a brain level, (laughs) um, the things we don't see. So yeah, there's, there's all kinds of ways to, to engage with music. I can go more into it if you'd like, or, um, we, we can mom and I did not sing because we did not want the neighborhood cats to come screeching at us, (laughs) but I did get her to dance. Um, what I remember my grandmother, my maternal grandmother listening to was Nat King Cole. Oh, and yeah. so this was like springtime, I think. And we, I was like, the song that I picked for her was Lazy Hazy Crazy Days of Summer. It's a freaking mm-hmm. tongue twister. Too early for a Monday. <laughs> <laughs> you got it, And though. I got her up and dancing. And I think she probably would have connected better if it, if I had had my headphones available for her to hear it. You know, I was playing it for my phone. Because it was almost like, oh, there's music. Oh, yeah, I like this. You know, it was just kind of like it took her a minute to like dial into what we were doing. And I had to dance with her, which was fine. Um, But yeah, no singing because we didn't want we didn't want people calling 911 (laughs) or animal (laughs) control. (laughs) No, no singing is um, like no, nobody in my family is really 
capable of singing very well. So um, <laughs> I didn't at the time I didn't know. And I probably would have been hesitant to like give her like an instrument, like a tambourine or something, because, you know, it's I still struggle with the fine line between, you know, they're an adult. They need to be treated mm -hmm. like an adult, but their brain is, you know, devolving into their skill set is more of a, a toddler or a young child, which, yep. you know, that's that's just their brain. That's not their yeah. lived experiences. So it's like. How did how do you balance it? So I was very careful, and Mom made it real easy to be real careful not to slide into anything that she might feel was childish. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's a good point. I I forgot to mention instead of just handing them an instrument like a maraca or tambourine, like offering the choice, like would you like to play this? Would you like to give it a try? Or even the choice between two, do you want to, would you like to try this one or this one? And then modeling, modeling it so that they, they kind of see you doing it. And it's like, oh, she's playing. Like, I want to play along with her. <laughs> Sometimes I see like videos from care homes where the residents, they've got like really long drumsticks and they're like beating on an exercise ball. And I, I always wonder, I'm like, they really like that or is it just something to pass the time because <laughs> it just yeah. seems a little i don't know i mean it i'm sure it makes a really good resonant sound i i did play in the marching band as a teenager so i have uh -huh. I have a few humble skills in that direction but you know i just i guess well it's all those exercise balls aren't cheap but they are definitely cheaper than drums so i'm probably yeah, a little well definitely you want it as much as possible, you want it to be their, their choice and not, not forcing anything on them for sure. But, um, giving them as much power to choose, to make a choice. I can't imagine these, these older 70 and 80 year old residents, like engaging with the quote drum circle, which is what it looks like. Except it's not drums. It's an exercise uh, ball. Cardi cardio drumming. Yeah. Oh it can, yeah. It can be a I lot guess. of fun. I, I think you can tell on the face if they're on their faces, if they're enjoying it. I've, I've seen that too. And I've seen a lot of smiles and laughter and just having a good time with it. <laughs> I'll have to watch those videos closer. Cause I always seem to focus in on the, the little old lady that reminds me of my grandmother. Cause my okay. mom passed away at 77. So she doesn't like a lot, when I look at a lot of those videos, my mom doesn't pop into my head because she wasn't as old as most of those residents, which is sad for me, but you know, it is what it is. But I, there's always one that reminds me of my maternal grandmother and I don't know, maybe they remind me of my grandmother because they have like the same expression. <laughs> <laughs> they look like they're like, um, they're not laughing. I'll have to watch closer because sometimes I look them like, oh my God, are we banging on an exercise ball again. <laughs> so what, yeah. so that one's actually a cardio exercise. Well, it, it, they call it cardio drumming because it does really get the body moving quite a bit. Um, you can do it from a seated position or a standing position. You can get special trainings in how to lead and facilitate the, the sessions. And, um, I've, I've done a little of it. I haven't done any of the trainings, but it can be a lot of fun. And it um, works great with kids too. So if you have, I, I've done it a couple times over zoom, which is a challenge yeah. um, in an intergenerational type setting. So it was kids and older adults <laughs> together. I would think they would like that. You know, the little, little old ladies would love that. Cause you know, there'd be like grandma, grandkid time. Yep. And, you know, exactly. they're like playing. So what other ways should we, especially maybe for kids, families that are taking care of a loved one at home, you know, what maybe is there, what's some, what are some techniques we can use to kind of help, help ease them through the day, maybe especially at the sundowning part of the day. Mm -hmm. I just read some gal says sometimes she's just got to let her mom just do what she does with the sundowning because it's going to happen what, regardless of what the caregiver is doing. Mm -hmm. So the more tools we have, the yeah. better. Yeah. So if you, if you know their preferred music, if you know specific songs or genres, they really resonate with then that's, you have a leg up, <laughs> um, so you know where to start. And, um, 
we talked about singing and playing. So with, I mean, singing, a lot of people feel self-conscious about it. Um, but I just, I always tell my clients, like, it doesn't matter how you sound, it just matters that you sing because it's the act of singing in and of itself that brings about the benefits. So, um, you know, singing a song together goes a long way to, to connect, to, um, relieve stress and anxiety. As I mentioned before, um, it can be a great transition to something else, um, almost like a distraction. So it, so with sundowning, the body's doing its thing and, um, music can, can almost be a distraction to that period and help, help the individual get through it. Um, dancing we talked about and then um using music for relaxation and calming so creating an environment that is um comfortable and calm and we can do that with sound and that could that could be anything whatever whatever helps um whatever type of music helps bring about that that feeling of calm and relaxation so using music to relax, to, um, just listening to music and reminiscing. Reminiscing is good. Reminiscing to, uh, music to prompt reminiscing, bring about memories. Um, it can just start with a simple question. Like, does this song make you think of anything or, um, what was, what was going on? in around you when this, um, song was popular, like what was going on in your life? Um, if they, if they still have that long-term memory, they can often go back to that period in life and just reminisce about the good times, the bad times, (laughs) everything in between. (laughs) And even if they don't remember correctly, you might get a funny story. Exactly. A quick question. Cause like we were talking about using music to set a mood. And I actually really, really love some of the Apple playlists. They're you know, like, they have of like Sunday morning brunch and they have one, I'm a tea person. So they have one that was like morning tea. And I'm like, what kind of playlist is morning tea? And I've listened to it and I enjoy it. It's not a hundred percent my favorite. There's a couple that I really like, but sometimes when I'm working and I'm writing, cause obviously you can't listen to things with words. If you're trying to write, or at least I can't. So I actually, um, not as much in our new home because it's much quieter here, but in our old home that there's a lot more, um, ambient street noise and everything going on. I would put on the nature sounds Mm -hmm. playlist, which is, I think it's over an hour. It might be a couple hours and it's, um, birds chirping. I mean, it's not just like rain or ocean because those things always make me have to run to the bathroom. (laughs) (laughs) Those are not necessarily the best playlist for me. But are those beneficial? Just like if it's in the background, just like this constant nature sound, especially if like, you know, for those that are in a care home, it might be better to play nature sounds over music. They can be for sure. Not I'm. I mean, we're not all the same. Not everyone finds them relaxing. So I would say it's a case by case basis, but I I think in general, like people, people enjoy the sounds of nature and that can be a nice break from, from the uh, structure that comes with music. Those sounds are more free flowing, whereas music is more structured. Songs have a start and an end um, that ambient, uh, type of noise kind of just flows one into the next. There are so many resources out there. Um, as far as playlists, I, I use Spotify quite a bit and there's like all kinds of playlists on there. You can find ones that, um, like spas use and just pull those. Um, there's all kinds of playlists based on mood. I just found one recently. It's called sunshine song. So it's, very upbeat and bright, a whole bunch of really upbeat songs, happy sounding. Um, but then there, you can go to the other end and find ones that are more, um, uh, calm or moody, more moody (laughs) type, 
songs. Or Which is uh, probably not the best playlist for somebody with de- dementia. Yeah, yeah. It just, I, I mean, it could be for the caregiver too. Like if you're just feeling like you need um, something, you need to listen to something that kind of matches how you're feeling. You can get support from that. Like just, you know, cause music is a way, music is so expressive. It's a way to let our emotions out and be like, feel something rather than just stuffing those feelings away. Yeah, actually, because I really like listening to surprise, like listening to podcasts. And during the pandemic, you know, the height of it, there was just some days where it's like I work I've worked from home forever. So I'm not I don't have a problem being at home all the time, but not having the ability to go and do your normal stuff was just wearing on me. And my mom had passed away. And it was just, you know, it was just a rough time. And I just felt the weight of everything just pressing down on me. And I was like, this is like I could feel I'm like, I got to I got to snap this this mood and into a better direction or else this is just going to be a crappy day. And I believe it was like a Saturday or something. So it, it was like a day to like enjoy and not have to worry about, you know, working and doing stuff. And so I found um, it was it's. Um, Huey Lewis had basically it was like a radio show. OK, so I'm a, a an 80s baby, not 80s baby, but an 80s teenager. And so 80s music's really fun. And this was kind of like the old top 40 radio station. And he was tell in between songs, he was telling stories like from recording and like, oh, you know, and I totally just can't remember all the details because that's just not how I listen to things. But it was like, oh, yeah, Mick Jagger stopped by and we just like jammed on this, that. And the other thing. It was like it was really cool. And I felt like a thousand percent better. And I was like dancing around the bathroom and i just like my mood went from crappy to like you know like i could conquer covid all by myself that morning (laughs) it's just amazing how you know like i don't listen to like music that's kind of sad because it'll it'll bring me down but yeah that just like really lifted me and just that little extra bit of storytelling like the behind the story behind the music stories were just really fascinating. I was like, oh, I love this. I wish they'd do more of those. <laughs> now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure Or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Definitely. I love that example too. Like we've all experienced music in one way or another throughout our lives. Like those powerful moments where it could be a memory and a song that's tied to that memory. And anytime you hear that song, it's like, it brings you right back. And those are powerful, powerful moments. And it, and it does do that with people with, you know, dementia, which is fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you do in your, I don't know if you want to call it practice and your business. How do you help people with dementia and their loved ones that are caring for them? What are some of the mm-hmm. tricks of the trade that you, you have that you feel like sharing with us? Sure. So as a music therapist, I, um, well, pre pre COVID I was a traveling music therapist. So I would go around to 
all kinds of care communities, assisted living, dementia care, and um, bring instruments, bring my guitar, and typically lead an hour-long session with a group of residents. And um, I would get to know them over, over time, visiting them regularly. And so I get to know what kind of music they like. And I usually going in the first time, I usually start with the basic, like the generally well-known songs. And um, so we do, we sing together, we play instruments, we do movement to music. So it's all about engaging them, um, body, getting their bodies moving, um, engaging them, their minds and helping them connect with each other too. Because even in a community setting, like there can be a lot of isolation and loneliness and residents sometimes just keep to themselves in their own room. So getting them out, drawing them into a group setting is really important. And um, we we acknowledge each person by name as we're starting the group. Like we, um, I, I sing to each person by name so that they know like they're, they're um, known and seen and um, and then the other group members can say, oh, so-and-so is here today, like, and, and form a connection through music. So it's all, it's all about using music to, to, um, prompt engagement and, um, benefit them in one way or another. And I've seen, I've seen a lot of like in the moment responses where, you know, music just, it causes something to click and they, um, maybe they came into the group and they're, they were kind of withdrawn or head down, like not, not really engaging with the world around them. And then they hear the music and it's like, Oh, their head pops up. And they're like, Oh, that like this person's here and singing and, Oh, I'm going to start, I'm going to sing with them. And before they know it, like they're participating and, it's just beautiful to see um, how that happens so naturally through music. Music is a natural motivator. That is true. <laughs> I just it was very frustrating with my mom because I just never quite had that breakthrough. I think I needed more of like the information we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. And maybe if I hadn't been uh, resistant to quote unquote singing, <laughs> quote singing in our case, because we always had the family joke that you couldn't carry a tune if somebody gave you a handle. That's the kind of <laughs> sappy ass humor my family had. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it's true. Although if I work at it, I can, I can be decent, but it takes a lot of like thought and work. And it's yeah. like, if you're trying to think and work for them, it's hard to it's hard to concentrate on good singing form, especially when you, my husband can sing really well. So he's helped me. But still, sometimes I sing at the dogs and he's like, he'll howl because he's <laughs> he's he's interpreting for the dogs. It's this is why we don't sing. So oh, <laughs> but maybe yeah. it might have brought about something just because like that story I just told, that's like my family experience. And maybe that would have brought mom out. So I wish I had known that that would have been OK. You know, I was just thinking, like, I don't want to embarrass ourselves or like hurt other people's ears or, you know, like maybe irritate a resident and cause an issue so there's like all this like self-doubt stress you know just overthinking so maybe maybe we should have just gone on the car and howled away <laughs> yeah it can be tough for a lot of people to get past that barrier of thinking they don't sound good or like they don't they're just concerned about how their loved one might perceive it and all that and then there's the whole like I, I've run into a lot of individuals who had a bad experience with music earlier in their life. Like I've had um, people tell me, I was told I, I'm not a good singer as a kid. And so that always stuck with me and I don't sing, but then they, when they do give it a try, they often like experience this freedom in like a or music therapy group where it's because I always tell them like it doesn't matter how you sound just sing like I want to hear you sing because all our voices sound good together and 
Um, I always tell people just let, like, don't, don't worry about how you sound, let the judgments go. And we're just here to have fun. (laughs) Do most of the uh, people living with some form of cognitive impairment, do do you find that the um, majority of them have lost that? Like, you know, when they lose their filter a lot, so do they (laughs) maybe drop that? I don't want to call it stress, but that reservation of, like, yeah. I would not want to sing. Like, we just had a dinner party the, last, the other <laughs> night. I would not want to sing in front of those people because I'd like them to remain my friends and my neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, maybe if I had a cognitive impairment, I wouldn't I wouldn't care. Is that yeah. fairly I, common? I think so. Some of the, like you said, reservations or inhibitions about guarding themselves <laughs> can can lessen. Um, so that is in a way, a, a, a pro to their diagnosis, like a benefit of, cause I mean, sing like, I don't think people always realize how much benefit singing, just singing alone can uplift mood, relieve stress, um, lower blood pressure, all these, all these health benefits just by doing it. So I'm huge advocate for (laughs) music in general, but just really encouraging people to sing. We all have a voice and, um, it can, it can be a huge benefit to use it. (laughs) So if caregivers are feeling stressed and frustrated and ready to rip out their hair, Maybe they should, even if they can't carry a tune like myself, they, we, we should just forget that. Let the dog run out the back door and hide <laughs> in the yard if necessary. <clears throat> but we should just find something that makes us want to sing along. And it, I didn't, I guess I kind of knew that that was a benefit, but being hesitant to scar the world with my voice. Yeah. I don't generally do that. I'll sing little ditties to the dogs, but that's mm-hmm. about the extent of it, unless I'm home alone and I'm really feeling happy, I might sing along to a song and then really hit a bad note and then laugh at myself because I know it's like, <laughs> oof, that was bad. <laughs> there you go. You got to just take it in stride and, and, um, yeah. And, and really like the more you sing, the more you'll learn about your voice and how to, how to control it more. And it just comes with time, honestly, like, I, I had to learn to sing. <laughs> I had to go through that period of like, not really knowing my voice well, but then the more I sang, the more I learned like, oh, I can do this with it. <laughs> I always, so whenever I hit was- a, when I hit a bad note, I always look at the dogs to see if they're like, <laughs> if they're making a face. <laughs> I don't think they care, but you know, you kind of wonder sometimes. <laughs> when wonder you say, how they perceive it. Yeah, really. They probably don't care. As long as there's food somewhere along the next five minutes, they're fine. Yes. (laughs) So when you said when you were doing in-person music therapy and you started with the basics, uh, what you said, you sang their name and stuff, but what, not knowing the individuals, what songs did you start with? So I hear a lot of like the little childhood, you know, like not Mary had a little lamb, but songs along those lines. Yeah. And I think. You know, and then I think I, I see other caregivers who are like, you know, they don't want their person to basically participate in anything that can be perceived as childish. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I don't know where the fine line is here. Maybe one of these days I'll find it. But what yeah. songs did you start with that were basic and general to kind of start pulling them into the process? Yeah. So just going off of that general rule where songs from their childhood so it could be a children's song that they really connect with and i i don't ever try to make it childish <laughs> in any way um but if like i've had i've has had residents request the song jesus loves me with it, which is like a children's sunday school song and if they're requesting it like they'll really enjoy hearing it. So I'm not going to deny that, but that's not a song that I typically go in and use right off the bat because it's probably not going to resonate with the majority. So I'm going off of 
what will appeal to the majority? And that's like choosing a few songs from each decade. Um, like, Hey, good looking, um, a, a few songs from different genres. So like country, Western folk, um, big band. And then as, as we progress through the decades, um, getting into rock and roll and, um, you know, as, as music unfolded through the decades. <laughs> so, um, like take me home country roads is just a pretty well-known song. So a lot of people connect with it right away because it's like, it's just so well-known. So just, um, knowing like, and then having done it for years, seeing patterns of songs like, Oh, that one, a lot of people know. So using those, um, going in for the first few times. And that makes like, sense. Hey, good looking the- would have been one my mom connected with. And it's not one I thought of Yeah, because, you know, it was hard. There was some of the songs that I remember, like my dad playing, um, like tie a yellow ribbon. I was kind of like the message in that song is kind of sad, but not at the end. And it's like, do I want to play this one for my mom? It's like, I, I don't particularly like it. So yeah, but, Hey, good looking would have worked. I always have like a laugh and then a cringe when you see like a care home and they're playing, um, you know, like seventies and eighties music for their residents. Cause it's like, mm-hmm. Oh, Hey, this is really cool music. Wait a minute. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. my era. <laughs> yeah. They might, the residents might not be there yet. <laughs> These guys were really this one particular video. Cause I commented on it. They, it was basically like, you know, Um, not older, not every older adult is actually from the big band era, which is completely true. You know, it's like, um, way back in the old days, like my husband and I were wedding DJs and we do 50th wedding anniversaries. And so I just kind of recently have gotten out of my head that people celebrating a 50th wedding anniversary were like post-war, um, brides and grooms. It's like, no, most of those people were in the seventies now. Ugh. Mm Yeah, like it's like I'm not that old, really. But they they were playing like music from like my middle school days, and I was like, and they were talking about how you know this older adults connect to this, and I'm like, hey, this is my era. Wait a minute, does that mean I'm old? (laughs) (laughs) Well, there is overlap in the generations because my husband, for example, he he loves the music that his dad listened to, but he wasn't quite born yet (laughs) when his dad was listening to that music, but he grew up listening to it. So he loves it, even though he's not from that decade. Um, And, and then another thing I was going to say in care communities, it can be really tough because there's such a wide range of ages. You can have a hundred year old and a 50 year old, that's a 50 year range. So I usually go in with a wide variety, just a big mix of, of different songs and then, and then go from there. Cause I got to start somewhere. (laughs) That is true. Yeah. (laughs) I did have one who's a musician that used music, um, to help with mood because he had been a suicide risk. So he was not necessarily part of the dementia caregiving community, but he was, but he was doing music therapy for a different reason. And he's like, you may have to go through a couple hundred songs. And I was like, oh, my God, I don't have that kind of time. (laughs) But it's probably true. And I think some of the big band would have benefited, not benefited. My mom would have connected to. Mm -hmm. I did try playing. I'm like, so she graduated from high school in 1960. So I tried to play stuff from like 55 to 1965. That never seemed to work. But it was in the car. So I don't know. It was just it was always challenging. (laughs) Yeah, there's so much music out there. <laughs> that is true. You know, and I knew like what Endless. like we weren't we're not a country music fans in our family. Mm-hmm. Well, my sister is, I think, but mom wasn't. I'm not. You know, so it just I probably should have tried more. And again, it would have been nice to have some of this information like you're sharing <laughs> today, because, yeah. you know, I was just that. This was like 2017, 2018. So that's not that far back, but mm-hmm. man, the amount of sharing and sharing of information is really just 
taken off in the last two or three years. I've seen a huge jump in it. I mean, part of it was, you know, everybody got on Zoom during the pandemic and yeah. kept going with the best way they could. And, you know, yeah, just and social media has exploded, too. And there's so much you can learn in just little tidbits of information on social media. Like if you find an account that is sharing helpful, helpful information for caregivers, a lot of times they'll eventually like touch on music and how, how it can be used. But yes, I definitely agree in the past few years, like it's just exploded. And even a few years ago, nobody really knew what music therapy was. (laughs) And I was always needing to explain. Um, But now it's, I, I mean, I think there's still a little confusion at times about what exactly it is and how it can be used, but people have heard of it. They're familiar with music therapy and music therapist. So, yeah. Now, if a caregiver that's, excuse me, is listening today, can they connect with you and maybe get some more one-on-one advice? Yeah. So I have um, shifted what I'm doing quite a bit since COVID happened because I, um, my work came to a halt in COVID and then it's kind of been tough to get it going again. There's a lot of hoops to jump through to be able to go back into communities. Um, but I, in the meantime, and in response to COVID, I created an online program, um, that is dementia friendly and it's, um, pre-recorded video sessions or classes, um, that, that type of feel. And it's all about, um, meaningful music engagement. So it's very focused on like singing and, um, movement to music and, um, deep breathing and relaxation. I kind of incorporate all those things into each and it's an online program. So it's accessible 24 seven. Um, it um, is like a membership. So it's like a subscription where um, you just pay each month for access to our um, video library, which has uh, over 40 videos in it currently and hour long classes. So that's one thing we offer. And then, so my website is bridgetownmt.com. You can hop on there and um, check us out and reach out to me through our contact page. If you have questions, I'm happy to help any anybody out, help you get started using music. Um, so yeah, definitely. Well, the website is linked in the show notes, so you don't have to, you don't have to remember it. I know yeah. you all have got a zillion things going on, so that's you're driving, can't write it down. But um, that's see, like, that would have been something I would have probably tapped into just because my mom literally wanted to sit around and shoot the breeze, which mm-hmm. was fine, except that the breeze was the same question over and over. Yeah. And after, you know, and it's like, after a while, you're like, okay, I've answered the same question five times or seven times in 20 minutes. I need something different because now I'm losing my mind. And at least that's how it was for me. And it would have been very helpful to have some a service like yours that I could have learned from. and you know, mm-hmm. engaged my mom in better ways and got her moving a little bit more. Cause like I said, she really just literally wanted to sit around and just what I always call it. Yeah. It's tough when there is so much time to fill and yet it's, you're dealing with their care, managing their care and challenging behaviors at times. And just needing a break too. So, um, this program can be something you do with them or kind of just turn it on and, you know, like they're engaging in something that's positive and beneficial, not just, um, mindless TV or anything like that. Like it's me, it's me on the screen. It's almost like zoom, but recorded. So it's, um, me like, guiding them through these songs and it's all about like hey will you sing with me and yeah so it's a lot of fun and we've gotten some great feedback on the program and yeah well I think that's almost better because 
you know, my being in California, there's a lot of times where they're like, oh, hey, there's this webinar or, you know, come do this live chit chat with these characters. And it's like, um, that's at eight o'clock in the morning. Like I could probably jump up, but I have to do start my day with a workout or else the workouts don't happen. And yeah. I need it. So it's like, it's hard, you know, if somebody's presenting something and they're on the East Coast or they're trying to mm -hmm. cover the gamut of, you know, because we've got, what, three hours to difference from one coast to the other. Yeah, and They try yeah. to, like, split the day up. And so, you know, it'd be like, OK, it'll be like 10 o'clock on on the West Coast, you know, um, 11, 12, yeah. one o'clock on the East Coast. <laughs> like, like I, yeah, it's. Yeah, you know, it's the, hard. I'd trying, rather have it on demand. <laughs> trying to keep track of time changes. That's one thing we found actually is caregivers have enough on their plate. Like we wanted to cut out the scheduling, the hassle, like there's, there's no scheduling involved because it's available on demand. Like you can just log in and pull up a video and hit play. So it's, it's a lot, it's a library. It's a resource to just pull from as needed. And we do upload new content regularly and we're kind of revamping it right now. Um, and we'll probably do a relaunch in the fall, but, um, yeah, it's, there's not really much out there like it. And a lot of people say, well, I could just hop on YouTube and pull up songs that way. But again, it's like, where do you start with that? And it's, there's so much on YouTube. Like it's a lot to sift through and there's ads and there's, such a range of quality. Like our videos are um, produced by a professional videographer and like all, all that. It's very high quality, um, good audio and video. Whereas on YouTube, you don't know if you click on a video, if it'll be like a cell phone video or, <laughs> or actual high end production. So we just, and, you, you, and they have a tendency to just like, I have yet to figure out like on my computer. I can't remember if it does it on the TV because we have YouTube TV, but it'll mm -hmm. just go from one video to the next, to the next, to the next. And it's like, I don't think that's such a hot idea for any of us, but especially for people, you know, with a cognitive impairment and never know what might creep up might be something you do not want yeah. in their brain or in your home or any of that stuff. You'd have to be monitoring it all the time. Yeah, no, this this definitely sounds like a much better option. Like I said, I wish it I wish it'd been available when my mom was still around, but that's okay. That's why I like to share all these resources with the listeners and on my social media platforms because, you know, for people out there that don't think they can sing or they don't think they can dance or they just they just don't think they have the time to figure this stuff out, which is probably mm -hmm. the biggest case. You know, now you have something you can investigate and see if it's beneficial to you guys and hopefully mm -hmm. it is and everybody will benefit and we'll, we'll say the board benefit one more time <laughs> <laughs> i try really hard not to do that but it's been a crazy few weeks so this is <laughs> you know this is as good as it gets for me today <laughs> but this well, has been oh go ahead i was gonna say at least you showed up that's, that's what true <laughs> <laughs> doesn't get done if you don't show up which is true. So everybody should check that out. Like I said, the link is in the show notes. Just scroll down, hot link, hit on it, and it'll take you right to their website. And I hope that it's something that everybody finds truly useful. And I really appreciate what you're doing and that you came yeah. on the show today to share, share your opportunities with everybody. And I look forward to seeing the relaunch. Thank you, Jennifer. It's been a, a good time. Awesome. Thank you. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.